So hello everyone. Um, today we have a special pleasure and honor to, to welcome uh, professors uh, Peter Travny and Professor Reinhard Mehring, two very significant German scholars. And I use here the term scholar in order to try to englobe the different layers of their respective works, because they are both professors and researchers, they are both philosophers, although Professor Mehring is also a political scientist as well. And they are both outstanding editors. So on the one hand, Professor Trabni, as you already know, has edited Heidegger's Black Notebooks. And on the other, Professor Mehring is a biographer of Carl Schmitt, an editor of some of his important correspondences. That looks like we have a fair amount of experience of archival work here in front of us. And therefore, it doesn't come as a great surprise that today we will hear interesting things about archives and the concept of archive in a rather unusual double format, in a sort of counterpoint disposition, if you wish, where we will hear first Peter Travny, who will speak for 30 minutes about the archive material, and then Reichen Mehring for the same amount of time on the sources of Karl Schmidt's work. After that, the floor will be open for discussion. So let me introduce just in the first instance now, uh, somewhat, somewhat more thoroughly, um, Professor Travny. Peter Travny is a German philosopher and professor at the University of Wuppertal. Travny studied philosophy, musicology, and art history at the Ruhr University Bochum. In 95, he received his doctorate under the mentorship of Klaus Held with a dissertation on Martin Heidegger phenomenology of the world. Starting in 97, Travny has, was a research assistant at the University of Wuppertal in Klaus Held's Department of Phenomenology. In 2000, he completed his habilitation at the University of Wuppertal on the time of the Trinity, investigations of the Trinity in Hegel and Schelling. After his habilitation, Travny worked from 2001 to 2003 at the, the philosophy department of the Albert Ludwigs University of, in Freiburg as a part of a sponsorship from the Fritz Thyssen Foundation. In 2005, he was appointed associate professor of philosophy at the University of Wuppertal. In 2011, he assumed a deputy professor position at the Soderthorn University in Stockholm at the Center for Baltic and East European Studies. In 2012, Travny founded the Martin Heidegger Institute in German at the Bergische University in Wuppertal. In addition to his international lecturing and research, Travny taught as a visiting professor at several international universities, such as University of Vienna and the Tongji University in Shanghai. So I remind you just that the title of the lecture is, is Archive Material. And Peter, please. Oh, yeah, thank you very much for this. Uh... Very nice introduction, and um, I am. I have to say, I'm for the first time in Serbia, for the first time in Belgrade, and I, well, just arrived. So I cannot say something, but I, I'm, I'm curious to see a little bit, probably tomorrow or the day after tomorrow here in. Bedrock. So he said already that I consider myself in a way as, <laughs> as a philosopher, but I all, all also worked a lot in archives, um, especially in the German uh, archive of literature in, in Marbach, close to Stuttgart, um, where actually all the important legacies or there's another interesting name for Nachlass estate the the uh, the important estates of authors uh, poets um, writers and philosophers are for instance the, the the estate of of Martin Heidegger the whole material of his manuscripts 
is in in Marbach. And I, like I said, spent a long time there, not only with, uh, I, I didn't work only with Heidegger, also with other with other material. But nevertheless, so in this sense, I am on the on the one side, uh, uh, yes, somebody who probably prefers to uh, prefers the theoretical discourse. But yeah, I have also experiences with what it means to work in an archive. So what I will do today, I will start with the arche. So I will read something in in Greek also. <laughs> uh, you, you, I'm I'm sorry for that because I yeah. But nevertheless, I think it's um, sometimes you can you can you can do that, especially if it if it if we if we begin with the arche. So we begin with the uh, of course with the beginning with the beginning of the archive as a beginning. So the there is a very famous um, quotation, a very famous phrase by Plato. And this phrase reads, Arche gar kait theos en anthropois idromene soce panta. I quote the translation by Hannah Arendt. For the beginning is also a god, and he saves all things as long as he dwells among men. For the beginning is also a god, and he or it or whatever saves all things, so say Panta, as long as he dwells among men. Plato's famous statement about the Arche appears in a remarkable place, namely in the Nomoi, these a uh, very late uh, dialogue of him, in a passage in which the philosophers lays down rules for marriage and procreation. Uh, for instance, not to be drunk uh, on too much wine when wanting to procreate the children. Uh, they probably would suffer the drunkenness if you are too drunk by procreating them. This already says something that Jacques Derrida, for example, emphasizes in Mal d'Archiv. Wherever an arche appears, <coughs> a kind of archive is created, which is, which is dominated by the archontes, the archontes, by preserving rules and laws. So in this sense, the nomoi, the whole dialogue, the whole landscape of this of this um, quotation, the nomoi are a good example for this, because as you know, it is actually the text of a constitution for a new polis. That probably puts us in the middle of the problem. Derrida to whom we owe the deconstruction of the archive in Mal d'Archiv, immediately points out that in the Arche, not only the historical or political beginning prevails, but also the natural or ontological one. One could think about where this separation, commencement et commandement, he speaks of commencement et commandement. One could think about where this separation actually comes from. Does nature need a command? Does the city need a start? Does the city exist in nature? Nature in the city? Without a doubt, there is nature in the city. And Plato, by the way, calls this nature in the city war. Without a, a, a doubt, the fact that the arche seems to contain these two dimensions undivided is part of the essence of this concept. So that commencement et commandement is actually united in the concept of the arche. What is announced here is known in the ancient discourses as a distinction between, for instance, physis and nomos. 
It is uh, as if the Arche separates itself in these two possibilities, Physis and Nomos, as if it also enters into both. It is well known that Socrates <laughs> clearly sides with the Physis in the Theaetetos. This probably even continued in the dispute over universals in the Middle Ages, in which Plato was on the side of the realists and not uh, in the party of the nominalists. So one could ask where stands uh, the archive in this division of uh, realists and nominalists. And I would say that probably the archive is represented in both parties. <clears throat> the fact <clears throat> that Plato speaks of Arche kai theos is not a subordination of God to the Arche, but of course, its evelation. Beginning and God save everything. Uh, therefore, Arendt is correct when she translate, uh, translates that uh, the beginning is also a god. So that a god is also the beginning, but the beginning, the Arche, is also a god. The Greeks did not have an archive, but they did have the Archeon and the Archontes, a house of the man who ruled the city, who represented the beginning, the Arche, in that they had the power to make po political decisions. <clears throat> uh, Derrida speaks about that uh, in extension in, in, his, in his text, by the way. When I said that the Greeks had no archive, that is not entirely true. The Archeon can be called the first archive. It contains documents related to the origins and founding of the city. This happened <coughs> in Athens around the fourth century uh, before Christ, of course. There in the Buloiterion, the center of public life in a polis, the place where Socrates demanded to be fed alongside the Olympians in his apology. The written laws, state treatises, and lists of winners were kept. A distinction was made between autographa and antigrapha, so originals and copies. Min minutes of council and people's meetings, criminal trials and accounting files were also included in the Archeon. There was even an archive of oracles in Delphi, an oracle archive. I think it's very interesting to think about an archive of oracles. The whole thing the Archeon and and the uh, yeah the the knowledge of the Archeon is probably part of the of the history of administration as such probably uh, and it's of course obvious that we would have to speak about the importance of scripture of uh, graphe in this in this history. <coughs> Especially of, of, I will come to this, of a certain kind of scripture. All of these historical facts bear little relation to the famous book Delta of the Aristotelian lectures on metaphysics, where the philosopher develops seven meanings of the Arche all have to do with movement or creation. All these meanings have to do with movement or beginning or creation. By the way, it is also stated there that all causes ta uh, aitia are ahai. So every cause is also an, an ahai. 
Furthermore, and this is quite interesting and of course very important, physics, nature, is characterized as Arche. And this idea is, uh, is, is of great importance as is already prepared uh, in Plato. So physics, nature, one could say, is the Arche of the Arche. Physics is probably the, the absolute Arche. <clears throat> and then we would have to think about uh, physics and nature in the archive. What is the meaning or the importance of physics in the uh, in the archive? And of course, there is a physicality of the archive, uh, and I will come to that physicality of the archive. And now, before that, it gets a little bit esoteric. I go back behind Aristotle and Plato <laughs> to a poet, namely Pindar. Uh, a fragment comes from him that goes like this. Uh, Archa megalas aretas, onas alatea me ptaises eman syntesin treche poti pseude. Heidegger simply calls the fragment Aletheia, or uh, Aletheia, Aletheia. He translates, and this is one of his famous esoteric translations. Um, I read it in English. Could read it also in German. Maybe first in English, then in German, or the other way around. Heidegger is also good in, in, in German. So, so the beginning uh, is in English now. The beginning of a virtue for greatness, mistress, divine, unconcealment, so that you do not overthrow my sincerity in you through wild, hard, crude perversion. In German. Anfang eines Taugens zur Größe, Herrin, Gotthafte, Unverborgenheit, dass du nicht umstoßest meine Inständigkeit in dir durch wild, harte, rohe Verkehrung. So, uh, the Arche goes over to the Alithea. She is the mistress and is therefore explicitly assigned a gender or a sex, an androgynous one, by the way. If one were to assign a gender or even a sex to the Arche, she would be, in German, the Anfängin. So it's, of course, the gender of the genus of this word, Herr Arche. Aristotle establishes the connection to physics, to nature. The Arche is then a place of reception and creation. The, Arche, the archive, one could say, is a place of reception and creation because the Arche is this place. It is also a place of domination, mistress, a place of what Derrida called a topo nomology. <coughs> Plato is closer to Pindar with his definition of the Arche in the nomoi, also or precisely because he connects them to the god with a kai. Aristotle demythologizes the Arche. It becomes a central ontological concept. The neutralization of the archive is, so to speak, of Aristotelian origin. And the fact that the archive represents a neutralization of the Arche seems striking to me. There is an anti-archaic rule of the archive, there is an anti arche in the arche itself. Let us therefore assign a gender to the arche or take the gender, the sex, or the gender seriously. Aristotle makes the connection. Whoever says arche or physis must also say hyle and eidos, materia and forma 
um, matter and form, stoff und form in German. This has consequences for the archive. For this is not only this is not only as Derrida says a place of collection and law, but also of matter and form, and its strange unity. Archival materials are collected in the archive, but this gathering is something more than just a mere assembly. There is a hule morphism of the archive, a kind of materialization. This <coughs> hule morphism takes place in the foundation of the archive in its arche. This raises the question of Derrida's idea of a topo normology. Is it really the case that the archive is in itself a beginning and a command, a commencement, a commandement? Certainly, it is a beginning, the archive. That can surely be said with regard to the material in the archive. The material that enters an archive is collected there, and not only collected, but also select, selected. It is subjected to a selection, so to speak, to see whether it can be preserved. In this respect, it expresses without a doubt also a kind of domination. Not everything is considered archive worthy the archive is uh, a decision <clears throat> but and, and this is important now uh, actually this is probably the good the, the point of my paper but what goes into the archive is rarely something fixed something that now longer changes and develops. On the contrary, the material of an archive moves, transforms, or is the beginning of, of a movement. As far as the legacy or the estate, like I said, it's a topological term, estate, uh, nachlass, as far as the estate of authors is concerned, it is a matter of manuscripts over centuries, even millennia, of ephemeral ink that is applied to an extremely ephemeral writing medium. Sometimes the manuscript even appears in a script that only a few can read. This applies, for example, to the estate of Martin Heidegger, but also to Karl Schmidt. This is the next selection of the archive, by the way, that the handwritings are not readable by everybody. <clears throat> this means that the archive not only collects and commands by selecting, but that it is also a place of creation, a place of birth, if possible. So this is the physicality of the uh, the physics in the arche, the, ph the physics in the archive. What comes from an archive is never just what is collected there. The material is used for shaping which is the responsibility of those who process the material. These shapes or forms sometimes already exist, but sometimes they have to be created or even invented individually. All work with the material of the archive is already an interpretation and thus the creation of an individual. The archive is, if you'll pardon this metaphor, a prevented womb, if you want to say so, an anti-arche, a prevented womb. 
Because we must not forget, and Derrida is probably right, that the rule of the archive is rather skeptical about this openness to creation. The ideology of the archive, if I can, if I may call it that, the ideology of the archive, assumes that the methods of working with the material tend towards clarity or that they should tend towards clarity. This lies in the very concept already of the method. Mm. But the rules of the archive do not correspond to its reality. Uh, in this sense, I would say that the deconstruction of the archive of Derrida uh, could be um, interpreted also uh, critically, but this is not my job here. The archive as a womb is connected to a topos that may not have affected literary and philosophical production since its beginnings, literal and philosophical production since its beginnings. It must be clear that antiquity and the Middle Ages, for instance, did not know the excellence of handwriting. We often forget that we do not have a single handwriting by an ancient author. That means by an original author. There is no manuscript of Plato, or there is no manuscript of Aristotle. But for the modern, or, or, or the pre-modern, or above all, the modern conception of the archive and the manuscript, it is clear that it has the status of excellence, the status of the original, i.e. the origin. So the handwriting has the status of the origin. But this origin or beginning is constituted. It does not simply always exist. It first requires, so to speak, midwifery, if not even conception. Uh, there isn't not simply the handwriting, because you have to read it. The work in an archive, therefore, goes far beyond collecting and preserving the originals. The fact that the handling of the material often defies the rules of the archive does not mean that it is arbitrary. The, mass, the methods of working on the material often arise at the moment of its realization. Uh, in the moment of work as such, uh, one could say that the, the, the no, hulo, no hule morphism, no hule morphism without intrinsic, intrinsic roots and laws. So it's necessary to think about the laws and the rules of Hulemorphism. In this sense, there are genetics of the archive. There are genetics of the archive. But once such a method meth methodology is formed, it remains strict and consistent in the archive, of course. So the archive, the, the, the archive has no arbitrary rules or laws. There is no question that the archive has been guided by manuscript excellence for thousands of years. And now I'm closing my representation with a problem, uh, the problem that already exists uh, in, in the archive, more or less a practical problem, but well, one can close with a practical problem and tomorrow one could think about of this practical problem. So there's no question that the archive has been guided by manuscript excellence for thousands of years. So the, 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 the um, probably not only the Occidental spirit is um, coined by 
by handwriting, by the manuscript. This also applies <clears throat> where the uh, original author played no role. So we have, of course, only handwritings of the ancient times and of the Middle Ages. In this respect, manuscripts responded to a technical need. The media change to book, to book printing, <clears throat> basically didn't change much about this excellence of the handwriting. It must be remembered that well into the 20th century, authors sent so-called Reinschriften, I don't know the English term for that, so final handwritings to, uh, to the printers, after which the texts were then typeset. But no, and this is the problem, and here comes the problem, the practical problem, or maybe not the practical problem, I don't know. But no, the archive is facing a profound, a profound change, namely the farewell to the manuscript, the farewell to the handwriting. The material in the archive is therefore historical and will have been subject to enormous upheaval. Handwriting is being replaced by digi digital sources. Texts become files, and this has certain consequences. First of all, it reduces the readability of the text. What does that, does that mean? Reading a file does not require any further know-how. Uh, it requires literacy, of course, but about that, no special know-how. There's no longer any transcription, and the susceptibility to errors is almost eliminated. By and large, the archi archive work shifts to the preservation of hardware and software, and this already uh, is literally the case. So you have now computers in the archive shelves. The readability of the text becomes a question of technology and its compatibility. The digitization of the archive is therefore a major turning point in its history. A lot could be said about this, <coughs> for example, that digital data media are already very often networked, are located in networks and are therefore accessible to a potential public in a different way than manuscripts. The question to be asked is whether this orientation towards the cloud will ultimately make the internet itself a unique archive. And that in this, this historical direction, the archive will ultimately perish due to a major dematerialization. And not just because of dematerialization, but also because of the horrifying arbitrariness that seems to prevail in the cloud. So the selection uh, in the cloud, the selection of the archive seems to be undermined. So why have an archive at all when the cloud will have been the future of text and writing? And by the way, I'm not talking about the possibilities of AI at this point, uh, but what is clear uh, is that it has that it has already influenced our idea of how texts are created. So one could say that indeed AI is the devastation, uh, the devastation of the arche. It is uh, the destruction of the chi between arche and teos or the rise, one could also say, of a new God, an, an unknown God, if not the unknown God. However, we will still see and learn whether this turning point will actually be the death of the archive or its material 
we will see whether it will be the devastation of the arche and in this sense, the devastation of the archive. This will be shown over the next few decades when more and more digital legacies and estates will enter the archives. It could also be the case that even this massive intervention will not displace the irregular or the individually regular aspects of writing. One could think about the possibility that in every devastation remains a sparkle of life and light. The future of the spirit and its forms of expression probably has a lot to do with it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Travney, for this very compelling talk. Um, and now I will just present to you a biography of our next speaker. You can, yeah. There's some materials. So, <clears throat> Reichard Mehring is a German political scientist and philosopher. He studied philosophy, German language, and political science at the University of Bonn and Freiburg. In 1988, he obtained his doctorate in political science in Freiburg with a comprehensive presentation on the works of Karl Schmidt. Subsequently, between the 1989 and the 2000, he held the positions at the University of Düsseldorf and Wolfsburg, as well as at, at the Humboldt University in Berlin, where Mehring completed his habilitation in philosophy in 2000 with the thesis on Thomas Mann. He worked, <clears throat> he worked then as a private lecturer in Berlin until 2007 and taught at schools in Düsseldorf. In 2007, he was appointed professor of political science and its didactics <clears throat> at Heidelberg University for Education. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Mehring has published numerous notable publications, primarily on the history of ideas, and has built a reputation, particularly as researcher on the works of, and life of Karl Schmidt. He has also published a notable study on the political thought of and actions of Martin Heidegger. He was co-editor of the Political Thought Yearbook. Yeah, and the, the title of the lecture, his lecture today will be The Sources of Karl Schmidt's Work. Please. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me and us uh, to Belgrade. I'm very happy to be here again. I've been here in 2016. It was very, very impressive uh, a conference. And uh, first of all, I want to sorry uh, to excuse my very bad English. Uh, I try to get through my paper. Uh, you see my paper, maybe it helps you. And uh, but maybe it's much more uh, uh, well said than I'm able to to improvise. Well, I also don't have such a deep uh, lecture. Uh, like uh, Peter, uh, uh, not really a field philosophy of archives. Um, I thought Peter, uh, well, uh, you 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 made you gave me the idea that you made me clear uh, societies without archives they don't have self consciousness and uh, yeah, archive is culture, archive is something like mankind. Uh, if we don't have a self-conscience uh, about our history and so on, um, we are not human beings anymore. So also the question, what will happen the next years uh, if uh, it's uh, if technique will, will super, super wise, super overtake all these uh, uh, things, uh, uh, it will be interesting. I think if 
Carl Schmidt would uh, would think about uh, uh, history of archive, and that was a real, very strong uh, point you you said you gave to me. Um, uh, he would uh, talk about secular secu secularization. Yeah, maybe you can uh, 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 research on the history of archives as a history of secu secularization. Yeah, you, you talked about. Right. Yeah? yeah, and that is very interesting because uh, also you see that um, the idea of archive <laughs> also depends on on making distinction between public. Uh, knowledge of public informations and uh, private things yeah the uh, well uh, Karl Schmidt's archive in, is very deeply private yeah if you talk about hand script uh, uh, right, right now at the moment there doesn't exist any guy in the world right now who is able to read Karl Schmidt's hand script uh, uh, on his uh, short uh, uh, hand script. Yeah, he, he got a very private uh, kind of writing, which is uh, or, uh, dead about 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he wrote also books in something like a, a secret writing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, well, and there were also political reasons. Yeah. To uh, to write secretly, yeah. Uh, Karl Schmidt, I think you all know, uh, was a very political guy, very important as a lawyer, theorist of law uh, uh, before 1933 in the Weimar Republic, but also after 1933 <laughs> under National Socialism. And on one side, uh, he was very close to National Socialist guys. He knew. Uh, a lot of uh, important uh, uh, politicians of National Socialism, especially um, Hermann Göring and Hans Frank. Uh, um, uh, so he was very close to politics, but that, uh, of course, in a totalitarian system is one strong reason to be secret somehow. Yeah. So also, uh, 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 Kashmir was forced uh, also by political reasons to be very careful about what, what he is writing and how he is writing and where his writings are founded or archived. Yeah? So uh, 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 he gave it always if he was in Berlin and he went home to Plettenberg, he always took his papers yeah, and put it to Plettenberg. A little, so the to make it a little bit more safe, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ernst Dünger is a great friend. Uh, uh, yeah, he their, their papers of Ernst Dünger in 1934, uh, uh, the, the the Nazis went into his house and took the papers and so on. Yeah. Well, um, I I will make a very easy paper, uh, looking also for the time, and uh, I thought. I, uh, maybe a, a paper which is more something like a report from our working uh, to help a little bit younger scientists, but the most of you are not starters anymore. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, uh, how to think also about editions. Yeah, uh, my most important sentence maybe is. This is number nine. Edition, editions take precedence over interpretations. Yeah. Um, well, um, we, we too, and you all know that uh, the image of Heidegger or Karl Schmidt changed totally in the last decades because of all these editions. Yeah. And Peter told us, well, uh, maybe this year. It will be published the big uh, letters correspondence between Hans Georg Gadamer and Heidegger, and this will be very important for Heidegger discussion too, maybe. Yeah, uh, and all the things uh, P Peter did, uh, 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 these black uh, books of Heidegger, of course, they changed the international discussion. The same, of course, happened to Karl Schmidt. 
And Kaschmidt uh, was in a different uh, situation as Heidegger because uh, he was a very famous lawyer who uh, directly gave his his interventions, his political and theoretical interventions directly into the uh, into the uh, the political situation. Yes, he always published for the his present days and the guys, the German guys, uh, in his lifetime. Yeah, so different from Heidegger, he was not interested. Uh, in what is happening 50 years after his death or something like this. By example, Carl Schmidt didn't tell, say anything, no, no, uh, no, uh, no uh, rules what is happening to his writings after his death. He wasn't interested. Yeah. Um, well, but uh, as a, uh, uh, he didn't really took care of his papers. Yeah? By example, he, he never uh, or, or nearly never made something like a copy from his own letters. Yeah? He was always hand-scribing and he, he answered to everyone, but he wasn't really interested in what's happening or what happened to all these papers. Yeah? Uh, he, he always uh, was writing into the, his present days yeah, and getting direct, very strong yeah, um, approach to all the guys he, he was talking to and corresponding to. A guy who wanted to live in, his, in, his, in the moment, in this present days. Yeah? That's also the, the style of living he, he, uh, uh, he cultivated. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, as a lawyer, yeah, he never openly said what he really is thinking. A lawyer, a good lawyer, never has an own opinion. Yeah, if I'm uh, uh, allowed to speak a little bit funny, yeah, uh, my PhD, Doctor Father, he always said, uh, he always said. Oh, well, a good, a good lawyer at least has three opinions. Yeah, <laughs> because he, he must be able to change what he what he is constructing with what he is dealing with. Yeah. So Karl Schmidt, of course, he was also a gambler, and he told it himself, "I'm an intellectual adventurer. Yeah, and I'm." much interested in the ideas of others, yeah, but not so much interested in my own ideas. Well, uh, that's, uh, first of all, the style he, he took, he gave his interventions, yeah. Always interested in a, in a strong approach, yeah, and always knowing that you only can get influence if you don't say really directly and openly what you are thinking about. Yeah. So um, you know, um, Karl Schmidt uh, 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 was a great lawyer and also a great theorist of law. Yeah. Uh, and he himself called himself also a political theologian. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, the point is that he, as a as a lawyer, as a German lawyer, he wants to make influence, and maybe he somehow has his own political ideas, and also has his theological thinking and Catholic confession. Yeah, but he knows uh, he cannot say directly what he wants. Yeah, he always uh, uh, changes the style of talking about his ideas. Uh, he translates them somehow into uh, the discourse or uh, uh, the semantic of law. Yeah, that's why um, um, the difference between the all these lots of books and papers Karl Schmidt 
published his long life through. He became about 1977, and he made a fantastic PhD with in the, in the at the age of 21, and he published about 70 years. Yeah, and he he was able to write books in two weeks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, uh, he published very less of what he was thinking about. Yeah, and after 1945, he published very less things, and that means, um, well, we got a we got a big work, uh, a great oeuvre of Carl Schmidt after 1945. Yeah, with all these uh, cor important correspondences. Yeah, uh, I'm Peter. You can you can try now. The correspondences of Heidegger they are not interesting. Never Pergola, Lovett, not interested. But the correspondence of, of Karl Schmidt they are nearly all ingenious because he is always writing very impressing and strange things he never published before. Yeah, by example, Peter, I show you this. Book on Leviathan, yeah, uh, uh, correspondence between 1963 and 1966. Well, it's so, so strange, yeah. As a German guy, uh, you 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 try to get what he is saying, and it's so extremely complicated, yeah. And also so extremely polite and extremely. Extremely ingenious, yeah. Um, all these current correspondences, they are very important. That means, yeah, theory of archive, yeah. Uh, well, the first condition um, to uh, to get into this mind, I will say, um, uh, was to get into the archive. And uh, Kashmir died in 1985, and the uh, the first people went into the archive in the night in the early 1990s, yeah. And up to the year 2000, 25 years ago, nobody really was able really to get into the archive, yeah. The, but there are the first important editions from the archive uh, started in 1991. Yeah, there was uh, published the first diary of Karl Schmidt uh, from the years 1947 to 1951. And the people said, what, what, what is this kind of guy thinking about? And what kind of book? Yeah, it was absolutely strange to everything. We The people who were thinking about Karl Schmidt before. Really something like a second Karl Schmidt, yeah, which came out uh, of the archive, if you, if you say, yeah. And so that was my experience. Uh, and Andreas told uh, after 1988, yeah, I studied as I'm, I wrote my PhD, Karl Schmidt still was alive. And uh, uh, the people couldn't imagine yeah, that, uh, uh, that uh, all these things that come out of the archive, yeah, all the sensational informations about these extremely strange guy, yeah, wherever you just go with one hand into, into one of these letters, you say, well, I never in my life thought something like this. Yeah? So extremely strange. Yeah? And also extremely deep if you are interested in German literature and philosophy and so on. Yeah? Uh, of course, Karl Schmidt was an ingenious good writer yeah if he if he uses german language yeah it's something like hegel or Hölderlin. yeah so very uh impressing um 
Yes, that's uh, maybe the, uh, uh, in a little way, uh, I'm nearly finished now. I could, uh, Peter told about uh, also these uh, um, the problems if you go to archive, yeah? Well, I told you uh, it's extremely necessary and academically important to go into these papers, yeah? I will say, yeah, throw away most of all this international cultural discussion, yeah, by by easy going into archive, yeah, uh, uh, the story looks completely different. By example, Walter Benjamin and Kachmit, yeah, the the letter from Walter Benjamin to Kachmit, big story everywhere over the world, I will say, yeah, USA and so on, yeah. yeah. Nobody went into the archive and looked at the book uh, 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 Benjamin dedicated to Kutschmidt, wow. yeah. Um, if you look into the book, you have, a, uh, uh, you have thousands of remarks from Kutschmidt on Benjamin, yeah. And you will never be able in your life really to analyze what's all, all his comments. Most things you will not be able to read. Yeah. But the most important thing is all these remarks are very late. No remarks uh, from the 20s on or the 30s. Yeah. Carl Schmidt was an old man. He, he, he lived quite quite alone in a little village, and he took this box and he says, maybe if he thinks, well, uh, these Benjamin, Adorno, and other guys I don't like, they think he's, he's interesting. Yeah? So now maybe I got the time as a, uh, I'm retired. Now I can read such uh, a, a little thinker like Benjamin, yeah? Kashmir, of course knew much more important Jewish intellectuals. Yeah? Uh, the friends he were talking to, they are at least as important as Benjamin. By example, Ludwig Feuchtwanger. Uh, um, uh, uh, I could, by example, uh, uh, Gottfried Salomon. Uh, I could say, I could name some other, uh, by example, uh, if you compare to, to uh, to uh, Benjamin, the very ingenious, uh, literal, critical Franz Bly, Karl Schmidt was closely in friendship to up to 1934. Yeah, so um, the, the the image of Schmidt is totally changing if you go to the archive. Yeah, and uh, if you if if you if you are a little bit lucky and you have one week, and uh, you are able to read, you will find more ideas in this archive as any time in the international cultural discussion, I would say. Yeah. I um, maybe tomorrow I will show you a little bit. Yeah. But maybe that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mering. Uh, yeah, so we can we can start the discussion now, and we have some time, maybe maybe half an hour, something like that. Just a short question, a comment. Just a short comment, if you could comment on this. But I found that there is some probably. Com confusing to understand differences so i will if you have comments so uh conclusion from Pro professor Mering here is that additions go before interpretations and as i found uh, one of the conclusion in the speak of professor Tramney is that in archive there is always selection that goes prior so it would be different that there is all that kind of selection and interpretation even that you have addition so if you can 
make a comment about this. Yeah, well, we can, uh, we could, uh, we put, we could, we could put it like this: that he's, if he said this, I don't know whether he said it, but the addition comes for the interpretation, and I, and I, 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 I it seems to be that I said that, that every addition is already an interpretation. Um, but but both both things are in a way possible it's not that that they that they exclude themselves i would say that uh indeed every every edition is in itself an interpretation because you cannot you cannot just um it it, it comes with the uh well with the with the process <coughs> <laughs> of of well uh producing the the edition as such so um for me it seems to be quite clear that that uh that no no edition is possible with without interpretation but of course for for the reader or for uh for the student and so on, um, the edition cannot be uh, or cannot be read and interpreted on the basis that that you that you that you uh, presuppose it, it it is already an edition. So it's I don't know uh, probably the the. Fertility of a text, the the how can you say that the liquidity, the li the the liquid essence of a text it is in a way um, is is in a way already a, a, a kind of a kind of inter interpretation in itself. But uh, hmm. yeah, what would you say? Yeah, interesting, good, good point. Yes. Uh, well, uh, if I look at my 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 words, I'm I'm happy now that I didn't write um, edition. Don't need any interpretation. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and that uh, that would be my answer. In German, I like to I use the word editionspolitik, politics of making editions. Yeah, of course, if I am thinking about um, what I want to edit, or if Peter would would talk a little bit private about uh, the politics of making Heidegger editions, yeah? or just the politics of the name Black Notebooks. <laughs> this ingenious uh, um, uh, label, uh, people, or I don't know exactly who found it. Yeah? Uh, um, so um, uh, if, you, if you talk to uh, these guys who are making editions, yeah, then you get close uh, to uh, to a special type of intellectuals intellectuals who are who are making politics of discussions yeah um, that's very important every publisher if you if you go in contact with with interesting publishers for example the chief of Karl Schmidt society was a publisher a real intellectual, intellectual guy who is thinking about how to organize, how to manage uh, international discussions by making additions. Yeah. Uh, if I am thinking now about well, uh, what will be my next edition? Yeah. Uh, uh, I talked about Peter uh, two days ago. I had an interesting talk to a Jewish New Yorker intellectual professor in London. We will, will make together an edition 
and, and this will be important too. Yeah. Um, well, do you have a, there are some very simple and uh, and necessary reflections. Uh, what is possible? Yeah. What Peter uh, Peter talked about reading hand scripts. Yeah. What what is possible? Yeah, which letters are are able to be published? Yeah, um, and but also, of course, the question: um, what uh, what is necessary for for image? What is necessary necessary for uh, for for my own career? If you say, yeah, uh, so you 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 think about like a, 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 a politician, yeah. You cannot do. You cannot publish everything. Yeah, and uh, 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 some things maybe uh, are not uh, uh, important to be published. Yeah, I know uh, Derrida wrote a, a little book about the about just one sentence of Nietzsche. I lost my uh, umbrella. Uh, my I lost my umbrella. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, oh. What kind of sentence? Yeah, what a deep sentence! Yeah, umbrella. Yeah, well, uh, very religious idea. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think Derrida uh, makes something like a joke. Yeah, but a very serious question. Yeah, or which which kind of sentences of of a guy are are able to be published? Yeah. By example, I don't know. Yeah, uh, 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 our little presentation. Yeah, does it now go to 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 internet? Yeah, or we don't know. We asked. We didn't. Uh, we are, didn't ask about. Yeah. Well, in this internet world, well, all my rubbish <laughs> somehow uh, lives on. Yeah, uh, 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 and that's that's something about secularization of of archives and and. And the differentiation between private talks and serious interventions. By example, Heidegger, of course, if you look at what he was publishing after 1947, he was also, he, he really deeply thought about uh, the style of the books he published, but, um, but, these these ideas, yeah. the people often doesn't don't uh, publish at all. Heidegger, I think there will be, well, there will not be any letter uh, uh, in which Heidegger is explaining why. He did the Holzwege in this special arrangement of texts. Yeah, so there are there. Um, yeah, the, uh, there is no. Uh, uh, you need to have if you are a good editor, or maybe the guy behind the editors, the Herausgeber. Yeah, then you take care. Uh, about the oeuvre of what you are editing, editing at all, yeah. You don't edit something, yeah. So you you maybe you have to be a good interpret of 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 an of a of a classic guy, yeah. If you can help his work, yeah, by making additions, yeah, to to give it something like. Yeah, and I'm always thinking about such questions. Yeah, should I uh, publish something about Karl Schmidt as a national socialist guy, or or a, a, a very ingenious intellectual of of the seventies and so on? Yeah, so there is a politics of making additions. Yeah, and um, I, I I I we we we, we both know that the most people who are reading books don't have any idea about how difficult 
and hard work goes into these editions. And there are a lot of questions you cannot imagine at all. Yeah. Um, well, I, I got uh, I, I got a lot of problems also up to um, up to the judge and so on because of editions. Yeah. Always people who don't want uh, uh, something to be published and so on. And one of the most important differences is, is uh, nowadays maybe is that it's very easy to get into the Karl Schmidt archive, but it's very difficult to get into the Heidegger archive because Schmidt had, had just one daughter and she went to Spain and nobody of the of the of the uh, uh, of the family is interested in what is happening. So you can do everything, yeah, nearly, yeah. Uh, and Heidegger is a very different case because Heidegger is a big business for a big family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a question online from Zoom now. Georgie Yes, yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Professor Travni. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Travni and Professor Mering, uh, for your lectures. I have a, a question uh, about uh, Professor Travni. You said uh, that uh, the, the this process of digitalization would lead to the devastation of the archive. Yeah. And uh, my question is: it Does not this idea presuppose maybe a narrow con too narrow concept of the archive in the sense, for example, that through the transition to the cloud and the process of di digitalization, what changes in effect is the nature of the archive in sense. For example, let's take uh, uh, let's take uh, Facebook, Instagram. What we have there is not anymore for the centralized state archive, but individualized archives, archives of people's lives, images, stories, interactions, which at the same time are controlled, selections are made, and in a certain sense, a narrative is created. The memory is controlled and curated. So there are, in a sense, principles which guide this archiving of individual lives. Uh, and at the same time, of course, uh, with the loss of this, in Lyotard's terms, grand narrative, we have now many individualized narratives uh, and archives. At the same time, we have a monopolization of uh, these narratives through, of course, the, uh, the big tech giants, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. So my question is, uh, not so much will the archive be devastated, but the the changes, the way it is changed, so that it's much more privatized, it's much more individualized, and uh, it's not as centralized, so to say, as it was uh, before. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question. I I I wasn't I wasn't so sure myself whether it is true that that the uh the digitalization uh of the of the world or of of thinking of writing is a devastation of the arche i didn't i didn't i didn't say actually archive but arche um i, I wasn't i was not i was not i was not so or I'm, or I'm not so sure myself but but what what I would say, or what maybe we we could think about, is um, that that that's probably a very simple question. But nevertheless, one uh, what is possible is there a difference, for instance, between uh, between an archive and a library? Is is every library 
an archive. Um, so in this sense, I would say that you are right. In, in the internet, you can find these personal narratives. You can find a richness of these kind of personal uh, personal yeah tales and and narratives and 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 in this sense i would say it it takes a lot of of the of the of the uh, of, of 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 the domination of the no, 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 uh, of the topo nomology uh, derrida is uh, is talking about um and uh, by the way the the invention of the internet was went always with this idea of a you know a huge a new kind of democracy, um, a democratization of information and so on. I don't know whether this is really this really came out at the end of the internet, or we we really uh, are uh, we we really think that Google Google is 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 a new kind of of, of, of democracy, but um, nevertheless. Uh, in the archive, I would say, well, in the traditional, in my traditional or in the traditional concept of the archive, the uh, the material is not is not only already um, how can you say that um, a complete text. It's 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 not it's not it's not already it's it's it, it has something you have to do something with what you yeah. find there. It's not, the not, only, not only in the in the sense that you are reading what 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 is there, that, but you that you are in a way working with it like whatever you you take the words out of uh, out of wet clay or something yeah and, and this wet clay belongs belongs to the in a way to the archive uh, of an archive to these to the to the material of an archive and i would say that this kind of material you you are not finding in the cloud mm -hmm. so in this sense i would probably i i would i i, I would ask whether the uh, cloud could be the archive of the future but it was for me only a question i don't know an, a response to that but i would i would i would i would emphasize this difference i tried to explain with this metaphor of of the of the word and the claim <laughs> Um, so in this in, the, in 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 this sense, I would say that the clouds, or that 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 not every every production of of an of a text is already is already an archive. But uh, it's just it's wait wait just mm. wait traces of of. images yeah so i would just want to say that it was an attempt to, and and your question was also like i what i understood also an attempt so now we can we can think we can think uh, we can think about it i'm not i well i tried to say something and it was like i said it was like a etude not not really um but thank you for the question yeah thank you Maybe maybe I I will give a silly idea to this. I think Kashmit would would a little bit be I read the word clouds ironically, and uh, well, we, we uh, what is the semantic or the politic of the word clouds? Yeah, is the cloud uh, the Holy Ghost? Yeah, something like something which happens in 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 heaven? Yeah. Uh, Kashmir maybe would say, well, that's a style of neutralization politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the politic of the cloud, yeah, disappears in the word cloud. Yeah, and the same, of course, with the democracy of internet. Yeah, my uh, my uh, Freiburg uh, teacher, the great Friedrich Kittler, uh, uh, 
in the in the early eighties, you would directly say, "Well, uh, who? Uh, 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 let's not talk about software. Let's talk about hardware. Uh, uh, who owns the hardware? Uh, where? Uh, where are? Where are the machines? Yeah, and of course." He directly says, yeah, the Silicon Valley there. And uh, well, the so um, it, it's one of, you could, you can say, uh, well, the stupidity of, of the democratic world, yeah, or the, the idiot, uh, 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 or all these guys who really uh, uh, have a very simple idea of democracy, yeah, um, uh, uh, you can fix it. At these strange ideas, yeah, that uh, people uh, uh, don't ask the most easy, the most early questions you have to think about: Who owns it? Yeah, where are the machines? Yeah, uh, for Karl Schmidt, of course. Uh, 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 we are living in a political world. There are always owners and guys. Uh, 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 who who ruled the game? Yeah. Well, yeah. Probably th that's also another discussion. But probably one would think about the possibility of democracy before the internet. So uh, there is a famous, or more or less famous, just just a just a quotation. There was a more or less famous um, uh, scientist in Germany called Hermann Schmidt. He he is the German Norbert Wiener. So he is actually the German inventor of cybernetics called technology of regular regulation. And he uh, wrote a text from the beginning of the 40s. So he was close to, of course, to the Nazis also. And he said that the the engine in the in the engineer, the guy who produces uh, technical equipments, he has the power to um, expose the people to a totally new world. And if you think about that, nobody of us was asked uh, concerning the new uh, AI um, apps in the in the internet. That suddenly we have such machines uh, we can we can use now without any without any d democratic uh process uh, nobody asked i was not asked whether i want to i want to have ai in in the in in in, in my in my in my internet <laughs> or in the internet so in this sense of course techno technology is always in this sense um an uh uh, 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 technology pre presupposes a technological elite. There is, there is no, there is no, no way, uh, no other way to think about this. So, in this sense, technology is never the question of democracy. In this sense, that we are not demo democratically involved in the uh, in the uh, development of new technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the 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 I think Yanis Varoufakis coined the techno feudalist, the term of techno feudalism as some kind yeah. of a future. Maybe our archives will are already in the hands of of techno feudalists. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> first first of all, I I'd like to thank you. Uh, this is our idea to mobilize you as a first of all as a maybe huge archivist archivist mm. in this philosophy world plus friends uh, plus uh, potential friends of us and then try to to have seminar tomorrow and uh, try to 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 make several texts at the end and publish something in our journal. I don't know if you, before you participated in discussions like this together or separately or not, you personally. This is first time that you are thematized archive 
uh, as such or not. I'm not talking separately about Kashmir archive or Heidegger. Well, well, it's such a deep philosophy of archives, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, uh, as I told Peter, sorry, I've been talking again. Uh, uh, the the mo I always am astonished that these the very easy and important questions are not made. Yeah. So, um, yeah. We, we don't talk a lot, a lot about the guys in the academics. They they really don't know what what they are working with, how the books are made, and how the the, the publishers yeah. uh, rule. Also discussions and so on. Now I was always astonished about this. Great. I'm very happy that uh, Peter made this discussion, uh, Black Notebooks, yeah. But well, it, it was such a hype in, in, in the discussion, and nobody asks, uh, 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 is it organized? Uh, is a publisher thinking about how yeah. to make uh, such a big, yeah, but every good publisher has by example we yeah, are something like uh, politics uh, yeah advert advertising He's, he he makes strategies of selling books yeah uh, uh, we are asked but, uh, please write Frank, review Frank, and Frank, let me ask you before uh, archive as such is a construction is it correct construction of the yeah First of all, if you you will have your archive if you first of all if you are alive if if you live alone if you are young you know there is no archive uh, you have to have time to to manipul manipulate with your traces with the texts with the with etc. Um, archive as such is a construction. Uh, in your in Heidegger, you, you differentiate. This is completely two different archives, Heidegger and Schmidt, or Husserl of Derrida, because Derrida, for example, prepared all the time from the beginning his future archive. This is completely different strategy. But also Schmidt, because Schmidt had time. Uh, well, probably it's important in life to 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 lost something, to be lost, as Schmidt was, to have a time to arrange uh, his text, traces, etc. some cetera. papers in the archive and others to the fire. Yes, yes. Plus, uh, I think Kozalek, uh, this grant, huge grant in Bochum, is the beginning of Schmidt's archive, yeah? You have to have friends, you have to have, you know, uh, to you know, to produce archive, you have uh, you have some kind of uh, team, a keep, uh, uh, friends. We can say brothers, brother. Probably this is huge laboratory. These two brothers arrange something. I don't yeah, know. Of course, yeah, he's, he was important. Yeah. Archive is uh, arrangement. Uh, well. Did you find something, uh, something, uh, how to say, uh, uh, crucial, which, which, something secret? Uh, first of all, you, Peter, or everything was prepared when you came because you have huge experience of archive. Well, you, or Heide I'm talking about Heidegger's archive. Did you find something which is which is was completely strange for Hellman or for in the archive? In the, the archive. archive, yeah. Or everything, or or, or he, he knows everything. No, he he does not know every, everything. Of course, you find you find things. You always find things. And what you what you are doing with this? Uh well, if it, if I think it's important, for instance, I I try to argue for for a certain um, uh, 
yeah, I, I, for instance, I try to 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 convince them to pu to publish things which they didn't know. For instance, there will be <coughs> in the in the near, nearer future there will be two or three other volumes of the of the Gesamtausgabe with uh, some manuscripts who are not uh, known until now and uh, who really are, in my view, quite important for the whole uh for the whole heideggerian uh project of thinking but this is this is there there's there begins something what he what he called the the politics of 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 the edition uh the politics of editing um but of course you if you are if you are working with if you are working in an archive and this archive is not, yeah, in a way is not digitalized, you know, that, that you can just look for everything and you have to, you have to, to, to dive in, 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 in a certain, uh, yeah, like I, like I tried to explain in a certain, um, really morphism of, of the archive, then you, then you find, of course, things, you, you find things and, the, uh, probably nearly nobody knew what 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 was in the black notebooks really nobody knew that or maybe one or two people in the world before it came out so so but this belongs of course in a way also to this pol political problem to the uh, uh, normal topology to the uh, to the question of domination what would, that an archive is also is also not only a neutral construction but that that an archive is also built to dominate in a way to dominate a certain or to create a certain interpretation to create a certain also image maybe of oneself you know when, when i create my own archive it's, it's, a, it's a possible an encounter with myself so it's an encounter with my self-image in a way I uh, can answer too a little bit. Thing. Well, uh, uh, yeah, of course, first of all, there are lots of archives. Yeah. And if you, by example, look for the papers of Carl Schmidt, you don't find it only in the Carl Schmidt archive, but in very uh, uh, spread over everywhere. Yeah. And German bureaucracy and so on is. Um, has been excellent nowadays it's not yeah but uh, well it's absolutely astonishing what you can uh, find if if you are really <laughs> yeah but um, yeah just just two ideas um by example heidegger yeah uh, well uh, all guys say well heidegger was a philosopher yeah and uh, they organized and making addition uh, but uh, uh, with a construction of the idea of philosophy, which, well, was not the idea of Heidegger, yeah? But I would say, yeah, maybe the only sense of this work was to get the women, the girls, yeah? But there is no love correspondence is ever edited of all these love affairs from Heidegger, yeah? So if you say, well, philosophy is a, is, is, is a project of man, to get women into into sexual relations, yeah, uh, then you 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 will you have to edit very different correspondences, and it could be uh, a very. I think it's quite close to the reality of Heidegger's philosophy, but that's another a different case. Yeah, uh, I call it in Germany Wettkanten philosophy. Yeah, and uh, 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 well, we say he was a uh, something like a for fewer yeah uh, Heidegger always wanted to get the girls yeah that's one of the yeah, functions of this work yeah uh, well the other thing is um very interesting if you talk about uh guys who organize archives yeah I think they are always always they, they're always making decisions yeah what they will collect and what not. And they are all telling that uh, the, the most difficult 
job or question an, an archive has to organize yeah is uh, uh, to get any ideas which could be what can be interesting uh, in future yeah of course other, uh, uh, I think the most the most uh, uh, German scientists yeah uh, gave their papers into the archive yeah uh, with concepts of their own on importance and so on, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what which nowadays nobody is interested in. Yeah. Uh, um, I think we all reconstruct these guys with different ideas and interests, yeah, uh, as they had during their 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 time to give it into that. Uh, that is very interesting. And so of course uh, we inter interpretation and making archives. Yeah. You uh, you you really it's really true uh, uh, here you really got a construction yeah there are a lot of uh, talkings about uh, constructivismus and so on which are not really interesting but if you really ask maybe Foucault um, Orton just discourses yeah organizing discourses yeah if you really ask yeah how is it made yeah then you can as an historian, you can make brilliant studies on it. Yes, yes, yeah? yes. Uh, I, I try yeah, to tell, tell me, I have uh, one like... thing plus. Uh, uh, I I remember I I worked I, I was ten days in Düsseldorf uh, in archive Kashmir archive when archive was there, and uh, uh, I had during you know the procedure I had to letters or recommendations etc etc uh i thought that everything is open is and the question for you uh, is is it something hidden or not yeah you uh yeah i, I told you you always need a license yeah and you always of okay, course have, have to respect some law questions by example you you have to to yes. underscribe that you will not publish something which is private in special ways and so on. Yeah, yeah. But uh, right now, uh, well, uh, the first um, we say in Germany, Nachlassverwalter, uh, you always need license from special guys. Yeah, the first guy who gave a license to Karl Schmidt, uh, he was very strict and it was very complicated to get into the papers. Yeah. Uh, uh, then it changed, and uh, uh, but it can change uh, from second to second. We hear in Germany that, by example, the Russian archives are closed again. Yeah, archives are closed for years and hundreds of years. Yeah, Vatican. Catholic Church, by example, yeah, and so on. Well, that's all the po politics of archives. Yeah, very interesting and important thing. And if you want to get into an archive, you must have, yeah, you behave as a politician. Yeah, saying nice things to the guys who give you the license and so on. Yeah, that belongs to the politics of of getting in uh, uh, the real of job of good historians. Yeah, they all can tell uh, stories about how they got to their sources. Uh, it's extremely difficult somehow. Yeah, and Peter, you know, we talked about the sources. Yeah, Arthur Liebert and so on. Yeah, uh, guys like Karl Schmidt and Heidegger. Well. Uh, we got a lot of papers, yeah. But there are also a lot of guys who are really important too. Um, all their private correspondences and so on is lost, yeah. We only have to think about the fact that you, you uh, quoted Plato, that from Plato we got the dialogues and from Aristotle we only got his lectures, yeah. And uh, it's uh, may it could 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 have been totally different. We know that 
uh, Aristoteles also wrote dialogues, and Plato also wrote papers. But from the one guy, we only got the dialogues, and, and there are lots of stories. Yeah, the history of philosophy uh, 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 is just something like a bad luck. Yeah, for, or, and and again, uh, yeah, uh, 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 questioning the, uh, that uh, some guys are edited and others not. Especially media uh, philosophy from Middle Ages and so on. Yeah, well, all the experts say, well, there are so big thinkers we don't know about. Yeah, uh, we just have some papers and others are, um, are well known maybe by, as you told about, yeah, there are some guys who by fortune get to the papers and so on. Well, they, just to say that and there is always a dimension of hiddenness in the archive because when you say that every archive is a, is a construction, it, it has to be so, the, because the hiddenness is a is a kind kind of a necessary consequence of construction. Yeah. yeah so in this sense, yeah, there is no archive probably without without hiddenness. Yeah, that's um, and no humanity without hiddenness. Yeah, that is. We all need these private secrets. We are ten minutes before seven o'clock. Thanks for coming. One, two, three, three four, five, <laughs> six. Wow! <laughs> Thanks for staying. So, should, should we continue then tomorrow or? Yes, yes. We will be pitiful because you just pull <laughs> down. Yeah. We will continue to so thank you very much once again. We continue tomorrow. This was really extremely thought compelling. So yeah, I, I can't wait tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.